Hello and welcome to the last edition of the IASB Update podcast for 2020. My name is Claire Short and I am part of the communications team at the IFRS Foundation. Today I'm joined by Heinz Hugevorst and Sue Lloyd, Chair and Vice Chair of the International Accounting Standards Board, respectively. A warm welcome to both of you. Today we'll be looking at discussions that took place at the IASB meeting held virtually from the 14th to the 16th of December 2020. It was quite a packed agenda this month with notable topics, including the feedback received during two of the board's recent big consultations. Hans, can you take us through the key messages that came out of the stakeholder comments on the exposure draft, general presentations and disclosures? Yeah, sure, Claire. So as most people will know, the objective of the primary financial statements uh, project is to improve the way that information is communicated in the financial statements mainly by creating more structure in the income statement. And to that effect, we published in a, our exposure draft general presentation and disclosures on December the 17th of 2019. We ended up being open for comments for 270 days, also due to the COVID situation. And responding to investor demand, the proposals in the exposure draft would require more comparable information in the statement of profit or loss. and a more disciplined and transparent approach to the reporting of management-defined performance measures, non-GAAP measures. And at this meeting, we heard a summary of all the comment letters that we received, uh, the results of the field work that we did. We, uh, normally, we test a new requirements with uh, individual companies who go through them, apply them, and see if there are any problems. So we received a wealth of information, a wealth of uh, feedback, and well, to uh, what was very constructive is that uh, generally we feel the proposals in the exposure draft have been well received by uh, respondents, particularly, but certainly not solely by users of financial statements who have expressed strong agreement with the project objectives and, and most specific proposals. And I think that uh, across all respondents, both preparers and users, there is a general agreement with the proposals for categories and subtotals in the statements of profit or loss and the proposals for management performance measures. And while respondents generally expressed agreement with the objectives of the proposals for improved requirements on disaggregation uh, relating to principles and, and unusual income and expenses, Many raised concerns about aspects of the proposals, including the proposed definition of unusual income and expenses. So we probably still need to do quite a bit of work there. Thank you, Hans. Sue, can you take us through the feedback received on the second of the consultations, this one being the comprehensive review of the IFRS for SME standard? Sure. So as part of the first phase of the review, the board put out a request for information where we were asking for views on whether the IFRS for SME standard should be updated to take account of changes that have occurred to the full IFRS standards and other amendments that aren't currently incorporated in the SME document. We put that out on the 28th of January and it was open for comment for 270 days, again a longer period because of the um, COVID situation. So at this meeting, we were looking at some of the key messages that we got in the feedback. And overall respondents expressed support for the SME standard continuing to be based on full IFRS standards. So they agreed with the basic idea of alignment with the full IFRS standards. Users of SME financial statements generally had a more neutral point of view on the question of alignment with the full IFRS standards. And many respondents also recommended that we look at costs and benefits in determining just how closely we should align the SME standard with changes to the full IFRS standards and interpretations from the Interpretations Committee. In terms of next steps, in February uh, next year, there will be a meeting of the SME Implementation Group, um, where basically we'll be asking for them to look at the feedback we got from the request for information and really to give us some of their thoughts on what we should do in response to that feedback. Thank you, Sue. And staying with you, there was something of a first at this month's meeting in that the board was asked to approve a recommendation from the IFRS Interpretations Committee to publish an agenda decision on supply chain financing arrangements, reverse factoring. Can you fill us in on why we're seeing this change and what the board decided? Sure. 
So this is, as you say, the first time that the board's been asked basically to agree that they don't object to the publication of an agenda decision that's been agreed by the Interpretations Committee. And this reflects a new step that was added to the due process handbook when it was revised in August this year. And it basically asks the board to confirm that they don't object to the decision of the Interpretation Committee that a standard setting project isn't necessary to be added to the work plan to address the question that was put to the committee and also that they don't object to the committee's conclusion that the content of the agenda decision doesn't add to or change requirements in IFRS standards. So as you said, uh, Claire, at this meeting we were looking at an agenda decision that was agreed by the committee addressing the existing principles and requirements in IFRS standards that apply to reverse factoring arrangements. And I'm pleased to say that the board agreed unanimously and so they did not object to the committee's decision to publish this agenda decision. So now that finalised agenda decision, along with the tentative agenda decisions that are out for comment, will be have been published actually in the Interpretation Committee's update, which is available now on our website. So you can see the update on the website or uh, listen to the IFRIT podcast that we will put on the website shortly. Thank you, Sue. Moving on to another topic discussed. Heinz, what did the board hear on the subsidiaries that are SMEs project? So the objective of this project is to develop an IFRS standard that permits subsidiaries that are SMEs to apply recognition and measurement requirements of IFRS standards, but then with reduced disclosure requirements. And at this meeting, we continued our discussion on staff analysis on developing an IFRS standard for subsidiaries that are SMEs. And for example, we decided not to include proposals to reduce disclosures for those SMEs that apply IFRS 17 insurance contracts. And we also discussed whether the scope of the project should remain subsidiaries that are SMEs or that it should possibly expand to a wider group of SMEs. And the board will discuss this further at a later meeting. And at a further meeting, we will also decide whether the consultation document for the project should be either a discussion paper or that we go straight to an exposure draft. Hans, staying with you, the board heard two discussions regarding mm -hmm. financial instruments. Can you tell us a little bit about FICE first, and then we can look at the post-implementation review of IFRS 9? Certainly. So the objective of FICE, the financial instruments with characteristics of equity project, uh, is to improve information on financial statements about financial instruments that companies have issued. And these are usually complicated financial instruments where it's not always clear whether it is an equity or whether it's a liability. In our previous meetings, after taking into account feedback received on the discussion paper that we had earlier created on this topic, we had decided to explore making clarifying amendments to IES 32. And at this meeting, we have decided to move the FICE project to, a, to the standard setting program. So it makes clear we are actually going to set a standard. And we also decided to continue using the expertise of existing advisory bodies uh, rather than establishing a dedicated consultative group for the project. And looking at the post-implementation review of mm -hmm. IFRS 9? Yes, yeah, so the board, as most people will know, uh, carries out post-implementation reviews, also known as uh, PIRs, of each new IFRS standard or major amendment. And basically, the PIR is an opportunity for us to assess whether the effects of the new requirements of an IFRS standard on investors, preparers and auditors and to see whether the standard has operated as intended or that there were unforeseen by effects. In October 2020, we decided to begin the post implementation review of the IFRS 9 financial instruments classification and measurement requirements. And as most people know, the PIR has two phases. Uh, the first involves an initial identification and assessment of the matters to be examined, which are then the subject of a public consultation by the board in the form of a request for information or RFI. 
And in the second phase, we consider the comments received along with information gathered through other consultative activities. And then we look further uh, whether any change is required. And at this meeting, we just discussed project planning for a first phase, so the gathering of information. And we decided that during phase one, we will perform outreach with preparers, auditors, investors, regulators, and standard setters. And the staff will also search for and, and review academic research and other materials, for example, news articles or reports that are readily, uh, that are already available and that we think uh, should be relevant to the project. Thanks, Hans. Talking about PIRs, the board also recently published an RFI as part of the post-implementation review of IFRS 10, IFRS 11, and IFRS 12. There's a lot more information about this publication on IFRS.org. There were also two other topics that the board looked at during its December meeting, but we're not going to discuss in, in any detail. First, there was a research project on pension benefits that vary with asset returns, for which a number of illustrative examples were shared to help the board decide whether to develop proposals to make a narrow scope amendment to IAS 19 employee benefits. And second, the board heard about sweep issues that were identified while drafting the disclosure of accounting policies, which amends IAS 1, presentation of financial statements, and IFRS practice statement 2, making materiality judgments. Any listeners interested in these, as well as the other topics discussed, can find detailed information in the monthly IASB update and on the specific project pages on our website, ifrs.org. Also on our website is a discussion paper on business combinations under common control. This was published in late November and the consultation has a 270 day comment period. Our board leaders have also been very busy with stakeholder engagement, and I'd like to draw your attention to two specific speeches. One by Sue at the AICPA conference on current SEC and PCAOB developments. She spoke about the impact of COVID-19 on the board's work this year and developments in sustainability reporting. She also looked at some of the board's priorities for 2021. And the second speech to look at is by Hans. He spoke at a virtual seminar on IFRS standards organized by the Japanese Institute of Certified Public Accountants. He discussed the impact of COVID-19 on the board's work, developments in IFRS standards during his chairmanship and future challenges. Both these speeches can be found under the news and events tab on our website. Finally, from a foundation point of view, three new trustees have been appointed. Robert Posen, Kenneth Robinson, and Earhart Shipwright take up their new positions at the beginning of January, and we welcome them warmly. Before we wrap up for the year, Sue, Hans, is there anything like you'd like to say? Sue, I'll come to you first. Well, what a year for everybody. <laughs> um, I think I reflect back and I'm really proud of what we managed to achieve as an organisation and also the work that our stakeholders still did to help us in that process. I was pleased that we were able to act pretty quickly from a standard setting perspective to provide educational help and to make amendments to help our lessees applying IFRS 16. I think we worked well in a difficult environment with our move to um, you know, a virtual workplace and we still made managed to maintain transparency. So I think well done to us and well done to our stakeholders who still stayed engaged and responsive and gave us comment letters and were really helpful. And really, I wish everybody a great Christmas and New Year. And I look forward to seeing my colleagues and stakeholders in person again, I hope, next year. <laughs> Enough of the screens. I completely agree. Hans, um, what about you? What are your thoughts on 2020 and a look ahead for 2021? Yeah, in, in many ways, it was a very difficult year, of course, uh, not being able to uh, meet in person, doing all your work from home. If people hear, hear uh, heard a dog barking in the background, that's correct. That's my dog who is uh, uh, outside my uh, office, wanted to get in. Um, so, yes, it was it, it was tough. Uh, we got, nevertheless, a lot done. But there is nothing like in-person contact while doing the work that we do. I felt particularly disabled because a large part of my particular function is to go out through the world and meet in person with our stakeholders around the world, something that I enjoy immensely, even though the travel can be 
quite tiring, but it also gives a lot of energy and I've really missed that. Mm. So I can't wait for the vaccination to get to gather speed. And I still hope that I will be able to do a little bit of traveling before I leave in mid next year. In the meantime, I wish everybody a happy new year, a happy holidays, and uh, especially that everybody stays well and uh, healthy. Thank you both. And I echo your sentiments entirely. I am looking forward to hopefully seeing both of you and the rest of my colleagues at some point in the in the first part of New Year. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us for our episodes this year. And um, we have plenty in store for 2021. In the meantime, you can find all of our podcasts on the podcast page of our website, on our YouTube channel, on Spotify and on your podcast player. If you have any comments on this podcast, please email communications at ifrs.org. Till next time, goodbye and have a happy festive season.